Financial stress is a significant issue in many parts of the world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where poverty, unemployment, limited access to financial resources contribute to high levels of financial strain. Now, the impact of financial stress on career prospects is particularly significant uh, for men and women in particular who face additionally ch additional challenges such as gender inequality, limited access to resources and uh, opportunities. We're going to talk about that now with uh, Vumile Msweli, CEO Hesed Consulting, joining us from uh, Johannesburg uh, to talk further. Good uh, afternoon, uh, Vumile. I think, yeah, you're an hour ahead of us. Afternoon to you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to kick off, what are some of the you know, major causes of this burnout and stress in the workplace? and how can employees and employers address them? So there are a number of things. Good afternoon, Rotus. So there are a number of things. Of course, heavy workload, increased financial responsibilities, diminishing resources. These are all things that a lot of us in Africa really are facing. And it's the reality that existed prior to COVID, but of course, COVID just exacerbated the case. Now, how can employers create a culture that promotes I guess, you know, mental health and, and well-being in the, in the workplace. Should, should one have a punching bag in the break room, for instance? How, do, how does this work out? So there are a number of things that we're starting to see as trends across the world. One of them, interestingly, is not necessarily just punching bags and physical activity, but also going inwards. We're seeing a big trend, specifically in the West, coming out for meditation rooms, having time and space to really, really calm down and recalibrate. And this is a, as, a, as a response to burnout. Of course, we know that someone who's got burnout is 2.6 times more likely to seek employment elsewhere, and that 63% of employees at some point in their career are going to experience burnout. So in order to preempt this, it's putting in place things like employee wellness programs where employees have access to coaches, financial coaches, have access to physiotherapists, have access to biokinetics, dietitians. People can look after their physical well-being as well as their mental well-being in order to be able to become more productive and ready for employers to get the return on investment on their employees. Now, you know, employees like to prove that they're strong and that they're able to stay up for hours preparing reports and so on for, you know, various workplaces. How can individuals you know, identify the signs of burnout and stress and take proactive steps to prevent them? So the first thing you know, need to notice is has your physiological rhythm changed? Are you now suffering from insomnia? Are you in a place where you're having obsessive, repetitive thoughts? I must get this done. I must do it. Even though your body's trying to tell you that you do need to rest. Um, it's things about starting to become a bit of a recluse, staying away from social activities, not having the energy to engage other people. It's um, You'll notice your family starting to say, you're not the same. Is everything okay? You'll notice that you start also looking constantly at what you can do at work, looking and fantasizing about being outside of work. These are all signs that you may be in a space where you're suffering from burnout, you've got extreme stress, and you now need to review how you're engaging your work. And of course, we want you to excel and thrive in your work, but we also have to be cognizant that you are the person that produces the work. So if something happens to you from a health perspective, your employer and yourself can no longer enjoy the productive relationship. So having a healthy balance is necessary. Now, what about some of the unique uh, challenges that workers face when it comes to burnout and stress in the workplace, and how can you know, those challenges be addressed? So the first thing we need to see in looking at burnout is understanding what burnout is. So burnout is a psychological response to chronic work stress. It's not, oh, it's month end and we've just got a quick, um, a quick deadline that we need to work for the next 24 hours, 48 hours. It is chronic. It is something that is happening consistently. So understanding that, they're saying this is related to work and this is, is, is actually characterized by exhaustion, you becoming cynical and really reduced professional efficacy and efficiency. While stress is now a natural physiological response, something that's challenging or threatening. So when the two converge, it's not only now psychological, but it's also physiological. So you'll notice you increase heart rates, you'll notice anxiety, you'll notice yourself no longer wanting to really show up at work or showing up at work in a manner that's no longer healthy. You recognizing that this is chronic is the first step to say, okay, this has been happening just not for one week, not two weeks, but it's been several months. It's been several years of the same thing. And I can feel my body starting to deteriorate. So the first is then saying, what can I do differently? 
is this a conversation I can have with myself? Is this a conversation I can have with my organization to say, I think I've put a little bit more than I can handle on my plate and I need to start getting comfortable delegating. Or I need to start saying, listen, I need a little bit of flexibility or actually I am going to disengage during the weekends in order to recuperate. So it starts to become a very practical conversation to ensure you are still able to produce without, of course, losing your influence and power within the organization. Great stuff. Can we drill down further on key strategies for employers to promote employee engagements and motivation while also preventing burnout? Yes, the first is education and training. And this means nothing if the culture in the organization is not looked at. If your culture is that your employees only sleep four hours a day and all of, and you're having a high staff turnover, you cannot then be surprised by giving them education and training and nothing changes. So looking at your actual culture to say, is our culture one where we're retaining our employees and now all of a sudden there's a, there's a crisis of staff turnover? So drilling down will be the first point. The second is an education and training to help our employees identify internally and then not only helping them identify and then saying as an organization these are some of the things we've put in place to support you there's an employee wellness program you can have a conversation to a therapist a psychologist a dietitian to help you perform at your peak from a physiological level this will also then allow our employees to make it normal one of the things I always encourage my clients to do is have a wellness day once a year, have a wellness day specifically for all your executives. Take a look. What's their blood pressure like? What are their sleep patterns like? This, these are the people who are leading your organization into the future. So if we're not able to create a supportive work environment, we will lose them. And of course, we all know that if we're able to have healthy, engaged employees, we see productivity increasing by 147%. We see staff turnover reducing by 56%. So this is not just you know pie in the sky nice to have. This just makes good business sense. You mentioned some metrics there, and you actually preempted my next question. So it is the the impact is measurable. Yes, if you imp, in, institute what those what you just suggestions you just mentioned now, you can measure whether or not any change is taking place over time. You definitely can. The first indicator is staff turnover, and the second in indicator is absente absenteeism. So we will, we do see a reduction in absenteeism because people tend to be healthier if they've got a healthier work-life balance. So if they're able to look after self-care, setting boundaries, and being in a space where they, in essence, feel healthy, they tend to perform longer and perform and work with us for a longer time period. So that staff turnover, that absenteeism, and then, of course, uh, most organizations do have those 360 net promoter scores to say, would you allow your best friend or your mother to work for organization that is an indicator as to how they see how well and healthy our actual organization is and how invested they are in us as employees now uh, finally we've seen the how this disproportionately impacts women how, how can employers create a more supportive and inclusive uh, work environment for the employees I think the first is actually engaging the women in our organization. We're seeing a massive trend where some organizations are even looking at having menstrual cycle uh, time off for women because they actually aren't able to perform at their peak. Looking at flexibility for them. Looking at what happens when you are a mother. I was at one of my clients, one of the banks here in South Africa this morning, and I've noticed they now have a nursing station where they've created a space for the employees and young moms to be able to nurse their children during lunchtime and still able to work. So all of a sudden what they've seen is that the young female mothers are no longer leaving the office at four o'clock because they've got daycare in the organization. So now they actually leave at six o'clock because the canteen opens a little bit later. So they're now going home for bath time and sleep time, which means in essence, they're getting an extra three, four hours of productivity that they ordinarily would not get. Putting some, some of these things in place increases the productivity of our women as well as our men within our organization. Great stuff. Uh, actually, in just 30 seconds, are you seeing this? Are you seeing improvements or do you have an outlook where you think this, this, this will be instituted in a number of firms over the course of the year, at least the ones that you are looking at in South Africa? I'm definitely seeing a massive increase. Um, there's a massive war for talent at the moment in South Africa. So we're seeing uh, specifically the Johannesburg stock listed organizations really, really starting to drive the employee wellness. We're seeing a massive uptake with psychologists being put in-house within organizations. And we're starting to see physiotherapists, biokinetists, dietitians also be included in that bouquet together with financial coaches to really help relieve that stress and burnout for employees, specifically within Southern Africa, we're seeing that trend. Great stuff. Uh, Vomila Nsweli, CEO, Hesed Consulting, thank you so much uh, for joining us to talk about improving uh, work stress and productivity uh, in the future.